Hi, and thanks for hitting the snooze button. I'm Neil Headley. I've been battling insomnia for literally my entire life. But as I got older, I started to dismiss it as just being part of the 4 a.m. alarm that comes with the 30 plus years I've spent doing morning television and radio. Then I dug a little bit deeper and I discovered there was a ton more to learn. So in this series, we help you try to fix your sleep by figuring out why mine is so horribly broken and maybe we stumble upon some answers together. Quick mea culpa before we get started. This is the first new episode of the snooze button in three weeks. A couple of trips to the ER and a nasty spill falling down a flight of stairs have a funny way of throwing a monkey wrench into your schedule. Also, though, a quick hello to what appears to be a significant number of folks who have just discovered the snooze button podcast in India. I'm grateful that you're out there, and I invite you to actually participate in the show. Details on how you can do that coming toward the end of an episode this week that I'm going to label without even a hint of hyperbole as breathtaking. The bottom line goes something like this. The more REM sleep you get, the less likely you are to die. Now, I'm probably missing some of the minutia when I say that, but that's where this week's first guest comes in. Dr. Eileen Leary is employed by a global biopharmaceutical company focused on developing life-changing medicines for people with serious diseases, often with limited or no options in therapeutic areas of sleep medicine and hematology or oncology. But a disclaimer here, the opinions and views that she expresses on today's podcast uh, are her own opinions and do not represent in any way the views of her employer. She's not speaking as a representative of her employer. She's speaking about her fascinating Ph.D. dissertation project at Stanford University. And as you might imagine, I have questions. <laughs> Later, we'll get to Dr. Michael Grandner and Dr. Seema Kosla. But first, Dr. Eileen Leary. All right, Eileen, uh, I don't know if you've heard that many episodes of the snooze button before, but um, let me bring you up to speed. Everybody that's on the show, be they a head of state, a world class neuroscientist or the drummer in a ska band, all get the same first question. And it is this, Eileen, how did you sleep last night? I slept very well. Thank you. Oh, yeah. What is I, what, what, define very well? What does that look like for you? Well, um. One of the things I love the most is sleep. And so when I get to go to sleep, knowing that I don't have an early wake up the next morning, it just brings a lot of peace of mind that I'm going to be able to sleep until I wake up naturally. So that was the case last night. I didn't have any early obligations this morning. So I was able to fall asleep with a, um, with a clear conscience and, an open, and just be able to embrace the night. So do you have a thing you do when those things aren't lining up for you? To be honest, I, in general, I sleep very well. I'm a long sleeper, which um, is one of the things, that, again, that, that attracted me to, to the field of sleep. So I myself, usually I need a good solid nine hours of sleep. So as a general rule, I, I tend to be a little bit sleep deprived because it's hard to allot that much time for sleep in our busy lives. I am a firm believer in putting sleep first. So I do have a, a ridiculously early bedtime for most adults to ensure that I, that I have at least eight hours at night. Okay. What's the ridiculously early bedtime? Let's compare notes. 10 PM. Oh, <laughs> I got <laughs> you beat my friend. <laughs> <laughs> For me, if it's if it's eight thirty and I'm not at least investigating the sheets yet, uh, then there's been some kind of something's gone horribly awry on the way. But then again, my alarm goes off at four, so you know. Exactly. Yeah. So I yeah. am by nature a night owl, so I prefer to stay up late and then sleep in late. So if I had my way, I would stay up until midnight, one a.m., and then sleep until nine a.m. Um, but that is not that is not the world I work in. So <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Um, so let's talk about this study uh, that has your name on it. Um, and I'm just going to read the headline and and 
I mean, the headline is kind of stark, uh, and it's what made me reach out because I saw this and I thought, okay, this, I, I need to dig a little deeper here. The headline is, the title is Association of Rapid Eye Movement Sleep with Mortality in Middle-Aged and Older Adults. And I saw that and I thought, okay, I need to do some digging. And rather than just interpret the piece myself and pass it on to people, I thought, no, no, I, I need to go to the source on this. So REM sleep and mortality, do I need to be worried? You know, it, it's hard to say. Um, this is an association study, so we can't say anything about causality. Um, so that's an important disclaimer up front. Um, but there is a very robust association here. I looked at this data from actually three different cohorts. So the, the paper that you're referencing looked at two cohorts and, and for, um, additional research, I investigated a third and found that this, this association held in all situations. I sliced and diced this data looking, doing a number of sub-analyses to evaluate whether or not I could find an alternate explanation. And keep in mind also that, that it's not a really, um, the, the measurement was not taken right before mortality, right? So in some of these data sets, we're following these people for 20 years. And I looked at their sleep from their initial sleep study that they had in a longitudinal study. So Anywhere from 10 to 20 years, uh, there was a significant association between REM sleep and mortality. So again, it's, it's not, um, uh, uh, it's, it's not, I guess, a strong, um, pro uh, time wise proximity necessarily. Um, but certainly there's, there's something here that, that warrants further investigation. Okay. So when we say there is, a strong association. Boil that down to the numbers for me so that I get a, a, a and, and everybody listening gets a better sense. I mean, I have the cheat sheets in front of me, but I would rather hear it come from you. So talk to me about what the specifics are numbers wise. One of the things I will uh, sort of preface what you're about to say with is this has nothing to do with the 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 fun that we sometimes have on the show at the expense of the science where there's a, an ellipsis and then the words in mice that's not there it's not a small study, study by, by any stretch of the imagination this is a large number of people this is a big data set so uh, the data feels pretty bulletproof to me so tell me about the numbers themselves Yes. So to give context, most adults sleep between, uh, spend about 20 to 25% of the night in REM sleep. And my analyses showed that for every 5% reduction in REM sleep, there was an, a 13% increase likelihood for mortality within a, a 10 to 20 year period of time, depending on which cohort I was looking at. So that's a pretty big shift. For every 5% drop, you are, um, risk of mortality increases 13%. And is it mortality from any cause? I looked at a number of different causes. So the, that statistic is for all cause mortality, but I also broke it down and looked at um, mortality specific to cardiovascular causes, cancer, and anything that was either non-cardiovascular or non-cancer related. So what we call other mortality. And the finding held across all three. Wow. Okay. Um, and, and we're talking specifically about middle-aged and older. So what age range are we looking at here with this? So the first cohort that I looked at was in older men. So the, the majority of the analyses occurred within this um, population of older men where the initial uh, research was done looking at osteoporosis, and then they did a sub study on uh, that collected data on sleep. So this this data set is called the Mr. Oz data set, and it's um, on the osteopor osteoporotic fractures in men study. And for that, the mean age was about 76. So this is an older data set for sure, and it's all men. So when I found the results th that were robust, again, despite cutting the data a lot of different ways, and when I say that, what I mean is, um, I thought, well, perhaps it's caused by um, sleep apnea, 
for instance. And it's really that sleep apnea is driving this association. And if we looked only at people without sleep apnea, the association would disappear. So I did exactly that. I looked at, let me pull everyone out of the, the study that did not have any signs of sleep apnea and let me rerun the analyses and see what I find. And I found still a very strong, clear association between REM sleep and mortality. And I thought, well, maybe it's antidepressants or depression. Maybe this is what this association is. So I reran the analyses, cutting out anybody who was on antidepressants or had a background of depression based on scales that they took as part of this study. Again, the finding held. I thought, well, perhaps there's already a a well-studied, well-documented association between sleep duration and mortality. So REM is... um, is circadian driven. So I thought, well, perhaps it's that, that this is really just picking up short sleepers. And so let me cut out all short and long sleepers, which are the two um, danger zones with um, the association between sleep duration and mortality. It's a U-shaped association. So those at the at each end are at higher risk. Again, the finding held. So this, again, very robust finding but only in older men. So the next step was to extend into another into another cohort. So this is where I looked at the Wisconsin Sleep Cohort, a very famous study that has been going on for, for more than 20 years that's been used heavily with um, describing sleep apnea. And it's a smaller set of, of participants, um, but followed for a much longer period of time The individuals are quite a bit younger, so a mean age of 50 rather than 76. And also it's uh, comprised of both men and women. And the finding held. So when I got those results back from my analyses, I felt like I wanted to run up and down the hallways screaming and shouting because nobody thought that the finding would replicate. Um, It seemed... There were just so many factors that we were, um, that were different within this Wisconsin cohort. So not only were we changing, were we adding both genders into the mix, but we were also substantially lowering the, the average age and we were doubling almost the period of time that we were following people. So between all of those three changes, it seemed very unlikely that this would hold, but it did. So then I looked, like I said, I looked at a third cohort, um, which fell somewhere in the middle. These people had an average age of about 60, and they were followed for about 12 years. And again, very consistent results. Okay, so the scientists that listen to the show, and apparently they're out there. I had no idea that there were so many sci- high science nerds. I appreciate you being out there. Um, apparently, so the science nerds that are listening to the show are are cheering and high fiving you uh, virtually because what I'm hearing is that you found something with the first set of numbers, and then you attempted to rip your own numbers to shreds, assuming you either missed something or misinterpreted something, and then did it twice more, and to your shock and surprise you were just as right the first time as you were after three times. Exactly. Okay. So that begs several questions. Um, Does that suggest then that REM sleep is perhaps more important than deep sleep? It does. And more important is hard to say. They're both important um, for different reasons. And one of the things I find so fascinating about sleep is we really know very little about why we sleep or about the function of a lot of the different sleep stages. And so we're beginning to learn more and more about them, but it's still a hotly debated topic. In fact, one of one of the conferences I was at last year, um, I thought that that um, punches were going to be thrown over this very topic <laughs> of the function of REM sleep. I, I've never seen anything like this happen in a conference, but somebody was so angry about the data that was being presented and the stance that the panel were um, were were um, relaying that he came up to the, <laughs> the the microphone with a full page diatribe about how um, ridiculous their <laughs> their science was and the holes that they had and that they didn't include him. It was 
um, it was a very heated session. Wow. Yeah. It's, I it's, had no idea that happened in the sleep world. I didn't either. It was, it was like angry nerds. It was crazy. <laughs> One person who I know is not going to be upset with with what you're talking about. Uh, she was on, uh, let's see, it was first week of September. Laura Boyerskaita is her name. She's listening to this probably as we speak in Oslo, Norway. And she and I had a chat about the glymphatic system uh, a few episodes ago. Mm-hmm. And she uh, has done a lot of compelling research into the idea that uh, despite what people would have you believe about the glymphatic system and how it tends to only kick in during N3 or slow wave or deep sleep, she's got plenty of evidence that suggests, no, no, it's a REM sleep thing too. So there's, there's a, a, apparently a lot of attention being paid right now to REM sleep, but for some reason, Deep sleep is the one that gets all the attention. Look, deep sleep is why I started this show a year ago, um, because my Fitbit and my sleep lab results and everything were pointing to the idea that I was getting uh, about 1% deep sleep and about uh, 7 or 8% REM sleep. And so I focused on the deep sleep, assuming that I was on a collision course with Alzheimer's. And now you're telling me that I need to up my game where my REM sleep is concerned as well. Yes. <laughs> um, wow. Because one of the other things that I looked at with this study is to see if there was a threshold effect. So the idea, are all 5% changes equal? Is it just as problematic to go from 25% down, down? 25% REM down to 20% REM as it is to go from 10% down to 5%. And the answer was no, they're, they're, it, they're not all the same. Overall, that was the, um, the statistic that came out of the analysis, this 13% increase for every 5% drop. But there was a clear threshold that happened at about 15%. So individuals who fell below 15% REM were clearly at higher risk than individuals who are getting more than 15% REM. Now, is there, do the numbers also apply going in the opposite direction? So is there, so let's, let's say the sweet spot is 20% or whatever it is for every extra 5%, do you reduce your mortality? That's an interesting question. Um, you know, it, it's... Um, you can, you can run the numbers either way, right? And, um, so it, it really is just an inverse of the problem. But I mean, in terms of, let's say, so is someone who gets 25% REM sleep, um, a, a corresponding percentage less, you know, less at risk? And then is the 30 less at risk than the 25? Where's the place where, and, and again, this may be beyond the scope of what you've done. Where's the point where the cost outweighs the benefit? Right. You know, it's, it's a good question. The naturally there is, um, a skew to the data that we have, right? Because people max out in how much REM sleep they, they get. So within each data set, there was really the, the maximum people were getting was about 40%. Um, and, and the REM was normally distributed. Um, so, um, I, I, it would be a good question to rerun the analyses only looking at, let's say, the top quartile. But it's, I'd, I'd have to look at that a little bit more closely. Hmm. Hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by all this now. Mind you, I mean, 30 and 40%, that's never going to happen for me. I, I, I just happen to be glancing at, and I, I understand it's my Fitbit data. So, uh, you know, it's flawed right out of the gate, but still. Absolutely. Don't even get me Fitbit. started on, on wearables. Right, exactly. Well, so my Fitbit thinks I got 10% last night, um, you know, which is, yeah, that's right around, that's right around normal for me. So that's part of why these numbers, especially when you talk about the Wisconsin cohort where, you know, the median age is my age. Um, that's, that's one of the things where I looked at. Now, when you say don't even get me started on wearables, um, I'm sorry, that's bait. I'm going to start you on wearables. <laughs> Yeah, so 
specifically with um, actigraphy data, which is what wearables are, it's it's basically just motion. Um, and some of the wearables are getting a lot more sophisticated, bringing in um, heart rate and some other metrics, um, light, those types of things. So they're they can be very useful when used um, appropriately. So. With a motion detector, it is not typically able to tell the difference between awake and still, like watching a movie on your couch, versus if you've fallen asleep watching a movie on your couch, right? It's not able to discern those differences. So it can be useful for looking at global patterns, but I wouldn't get lost in the numbers. Also, these these um, consumer wearables, they're constantly adjusting their algorithms. And there's very little data showing that those are, are um, held up against any gold standard like overnight polysomnography. So the accuracy of those results is really, in my mind, in question. And it does not benefit the, um, the consumer wearable device companies, whether that be Fitbit, Apple, whatever. Um, it doesn't benefit them to do those analyses because the consumers don't know the difference. So, the, so really, they're risking having poor correlation with their algorithms against the gold standard. And what the consumer wants is a pretty graph. And they tend <laughs> yeah. to fall for it, the client and thinker. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the, the bonus in, in my case, and I fully recognize that, uh, you know, on a night where, for example, if it tells me one night I got 10% deep sleep and the next night it tells me I got 4% deep sleep, uh, you know what? I'm, I'm not concerned. Uh, it's how do I feel when I wake up, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. The thing that it triggered for me though, and, and I, I might suggest for a casual sleep enthusiast, um, who's listening to the show here is probably, and, and Eileen, tell me if I'm on the right track here, the limit of how much stock you should put in the data from, for example, your Fitbit or your Apple watch or something like that, something that's worn on your wrist or that's sitting on your mattress or even worse on your nightstand, the maximum you should probably put stock in it is is if the wake versus sleep is at some number that is for some reason alarming. Um, you know, in my case, for example, I would go to bed and, and I'll, I'll round off the numbers, but I would go to bed at nine o'clock and my Fitbit would tell me that I didn't fall asleep until 1130 or 12. Now, what I had to buttress that three hour sleep onset latency idea was my wife's anecdotal information was that, yeah, I thrash around a lot in my sleep at night. So I put those two things together and went for a sleep test. And so for me, I, I, the data that I had was enough to make me do the responsible thing and ask questions about whether or not I should be paying enough attention to these numbers and this anecdotal evidence that I should get something done about it. So for me, it paid off. But for people who are doing anything more than that and putting any more stock in it than that, eh, no. Right. And the difference between wake and sleep and really fragmented um, high activity, right? So when you're moving around, thrashing around a lot, um, that's where actigraphy is excelling, right? Because it's picking up movement. So it's able to identify that you have a lot of movement during that period of time. So therefore, you are not sleeping. Um, so that's that's the perfect usage. When you start analyzing those graphs of this is how much REM versus light versus deep sleep I, I got, well, what I would want to know is how is the algorithm determining and separating those three states? Because in the sleep world, we use EEG combined with other um, biological information, heart rate, muscle tone, and eye movements with it, along with EEG. That's what we use to differentiate the different sleep states and different sleep stages. So what is this algorithm doing based just on movement? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, in, in my case, um, here's a fun number. And sometimes I throw this out just to hear the, the very first syllable that comes out when someone hears this number. Um, it, in my case, the three hours wasn't far off because I have a periodic or I had when I first went in for my first sleep test, I had a periodic limb movement index of 82. 
Wow. Yeah. So that <laughs> explains that explains a lot of thrashing around. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, and, and it was interesting cause I have my handy dandy bottle of Mirapex here that my uh, sleep doc put me on. And the second time I went back for a sleep lab, it had gone from an 82 down to a seven. Wow. <laughs> Better or living through seven chemistry. Or one or some, or some ridiculously, ridiculously low number. Like it, it obviously was the thing I needed to uh, address the problem. And so, you know, now, and especially when I look at things like what your study is throwing out there, now I need to work on the quality of sleep. And, and so, you know, I'm, I'm upping my game in terms of how I'm monitoring it. I'm putting a lot more stock in other measurements of my sleep, uh, particularly things like cognition. Um, you know, so, so there's a battery of cognitive tests coming my way that I can do on an even if I chose to a daily basis or a weekly basis where I kind of get a better picture of, okay, how is my sleep and whatever I'm doing with my sleep right now actually impacting my performance and my function. And hopefully I'll get some better data out of that. It's, it's going to be a fun experiment. Interesting. Will you, will you be using the PVT? The PVT. So it's the psychomotor vigilance task. So this is a task often used in sleep to, it's, it's measuring performance through reaction time. And it's very sensitive to sleep deprivation and sleep loss. That's a possibility. I know that the, the tests that I'm, I'm leaning on for cognition, uh, come from actually the very first guest we ever had on this show, uh, Dr. Adrian Owen, um, who, uh, has teamed with or perhaps is the sole person behind, uh, Cambridge Brain Sciences. And they have, uh, a, a whole pile of different cognitive tests available okay. on their website at Cambridge Brain Sciences, um, that, I believe some of it is reaction time. And I think there's a, a it's kind of a, a, an all you can eat sort of a thing of, of different, different tests of cognition. So I'm interested to see how the, what, what those throw at me. And Adrian tells me that I, yeah, you can take those tests every day if you want, and you'll still get um, numbers that you, you, you'll still get results that will be indicative of whether or not things are changing in one direction or another for you. Right. So there's not a significant learning effect with the tasks. And right. Exactly. Because that was my yeah, it was like the it was like the bias study that Yale put out there a, a while back where the second and third time people were taking the the implied bias test. They were getting different numbers than they did the first time around because the second and third time they knew how to game the system. Right. Right. You know, and so apparently that doesn't happen here. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what it spits out because the first time Adrian and I ever sat down and I talked to him about my numbers and, and, you know, when my alarm goes off and all these kinds of things and my sleep onset latency and all, he said, it's funny that you seem to be functioning at a reasonably high level for someone who gets as little sleep as you do, which I'll, that's as close as I'm going to get to a compliment about my sleep. I'm going to take it. <laughs> See, now I would be at the, the other end of the spectrum. If I don't get my, my nine hours, I do not function well and I am not nice to be around. <laughs> <laughs> so it's well, another I mean, reason why I go to bed early is, you know, it's a favor to everyone around me. <laughs> well, the funny thing for me is, I mean, I'm nice for a living, right? I'm not only nice, I'm that annoyingly perky guy on the other end of the radio that you, you turn on so that maybe I'll cheer you up enough that you want to get out of bed. So for me, you know, regardless of how much or how little sleep I got the night before showing up for work cranky is just not an option. So I envy the people that can kind of can go to work and, and not wake up until the third coffee. I envy those people. I really, really do. Eileen, this, this is fascinating. Is fascinating. Um, so what's the next step from this research? I mean, I know you've moved into uh, you, you've moved out of academia since these studies came along, but I'm sure this still has, at the very least, your curiosity. Absolutely. So, so um, one of the things that I'm really interested in looking at next is um, the the inverse of the association with um, REM and mortality, and actually looking to see if that how well that holds with longevity. So, I did um, have one parameter just to test the cohesiveness of the finding, and I did find that um, there was. So, I, I limited the group to individuals who lived beyond ninety, and or had the capacity to living living beyond 90 to see whether or not, um, I was finding that, um, 
whether or not I was finding something consistent. So what I found is that the odds of living past 90 was reduced by 11% for every 5% reduction in REM sleep. So it was good to know that it's telling a consistent story. So one thing that I'm exploring is maybe I want to do a paper just solely on that with that as my primary outcome. I also would be very interested to see how, um, how the amount of REM changes over time and whether or not that's associated with mortality. Because keep in mind, you know, when I said, um, that earlier that when I said that, that it wasn't, um, closely linked in the proximity of time that some of these uh, sleep studies were measured 10, 20 years um, before the end of the data set. Um, th most of these are longitudinal studies. So I can actually look and see if they had more than one sleep study, how variable was their percent REM or how variable was their quantity of REM and was it decreasing or was it shifting or was it stable? Is this just a set amount um, that most people get. And that's the, that's what is the marker. So I'd be looking to see how, how change in REM is associated with mortality. That sounds fascinating because as you're, as you're describing all of this to me, the thing that pops into my head and, and I'm sure for a lot of people my age, um, and again, that's early fifties, um, a lot of the what probably crosses the minds of people who are in that it, it for for so many things sleep and health related i wish it could be along the same lines of those stories that come out a couple of times a year about here's how much you need to have saved to retire comfortably. Um, you know, and, and if you are this age and you haven't saved this much, well, here's what you need to do going forward to be able to retire comfortably. I wish they were, were a version of that for sleep. I wish there were a version of that for exercise. I wish there were a version of that for so many quality of life related things. Like, for example, you know, oh, if you're 55 years old and you've normally gotten this much sleep, well, here's how much you need to get going forward to extend your life, recognizing that any improvement in your sleep is going to improve your quality of life. Sure, that makes sense. But like you say, people like pretty graphs. Right, right. Yeah, I do find it. Um, a lot of the research that I've seen has been a little bit discouraging when you look at once you, you know, once you've deprived yourself of sleep for this long, um, these are all the deficits that come along with it. And many of them are very difficult to reverse, which seems interesting, but also counterintuitive because for sure we've all gone through sleep deprivation and yet we bounce back to some degree. We can't be all under a huge amount of deficit cognitively. Um, so where is that threshold? Um, I, yeah. I and and really how much of it can you fix after the fact? Right. Right. Where have you, where have you hit the point of no return? And I really don't think that, um, I'm not sure if there is a point of no return, but I'm also not a neurologist. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I will give that caveat there. But, you know, Neil, I wanted to mention something else that I did with a study that we didn't really touch on. Um, because, so as you mentioned before, I, I pulled apart my research and tried to poke as many holes in it as possible from a scientific point with, um, with doing all these sensitivity analyses. But the other big question is, Sleep is a composite variable, right? So um, it's comprised of these sleep stages and they all add up to 100%. So how do I know that it's REM sleep and not, for instance, delta sleep or N3 sleep, right? Maybe it's less N3 results in more REM and that's why there's this association. So that was one of my questions, certainly, is what is the actual sleep stage driving this finding? And so I used machine learning um, to evaluate that question, doing random forests and conditional survival analysis trees to put into a model just the sleep stages and see how well each one predicted mortality, looking at um, a mean decrease in accuracy. So the idea is it runs the model and does a number of simulations and it pulls out one sleep stage at a time and evaluates how well the model, how much change there is in the prediction 
um, ability of that model. And the finding was that REM was head and shoulders, um, the most important sleep stage for predicting mortality. So that's, um, adds, I think, an important piece to the, the work, which is not only is this a very robust, consistent, reliable finding, but it's also clearly REM sleep versus one of the other sleep stages. Which in and of itself, I, I mean, it, while fascinating, that's also a little bit discouraging for someone like me because um, is, the, the, is there, a, I'm assuming the answer to this is no, there's not a way to target. It's just like there's no way to, um, in, in the weight loss world, there's no way to specifically target the fat that's around your middle. It's kind of an all or nothing scenario. So for sleep, there's no specific way I can work on boosting just my REM sleep, is there? There's not a way that I know of to boost REM sleep, but there are certainly ways to diminish REM sleep. So there's medications that can um, that can reduce how much REM sleep you get. There's also sleep disorders that target REM sleep. Um, and I say that like it's intentional, but it just is sleep disorders that are worse in REM sleep, the most obvious being sleep apnea. Um, so leaving untreated a disorder like sleep apnea would significantly impact the quantity of REM sleep somebody's receiving. So making sure that in general, um, you are, you know, leading as healthy of a lifestyle as you can with respect to, um, hopefully not needing too many medications. And if you are looking at whether or not they impact sleep architecture and, um, you know, and if, and if it is a medication that, that if you're already low with REM sleep and then you for sure want to make sure that you're avoiding REM suppressant medications. Uh, another is allowing adequate time to sleep. So REM sleep is um, not dispersed evenly throughout the night. You get the majority of your REM sleep in the last third of the night. So in the early morning hours. So this is likely one of the reasons why your REM sleep is so low is that you're waking up when your REM sleep is really starting to shine. So, um, and REM sleep is circadian driven. So it's not based on hours in bed, it's based on time of day. So your the timing of when you're most likely to go into REM sleep is really set by a number of factors, largely external factors like the sun. So that early morning wakening time for you, is one of the is what I would say is likely the biggest um, contributor to your low low levels of REM sleep. Wow. Okay. So I have a lot of homework. Um, one further thought to uh, something Eileen just said, uh, which is if you're thinking about the um, factors that might influence your REM sleep, I would also direct you to the July 20th episode of the snooze button when we had Dr. Ryan Vandry from Johns Hopkins University, who, if my recollection is accurate, talked about the impact that cannabinoids have on REM sleep. And if you're a person who is concerned about REM sleep because of the longevity aspect, you're not going to like what Ryan has to say. Um, because cannabinoids, whether it's CBD or cannabis or THC, whatever it is, my recollection of that conversation is that uh, it doesn't play nicely with your REM sleep. So if you're interested in what we've been talking about, go back to the July 20th episode and confirm whether or not I'm right or wrong on that. But my recollection is that, yeah, Ryan, Ryan was of the opinion that cannabinoids and REM sleep don't, don't play nice together. So that may have some other impacts that you need to keep and keep an eye on. Um, Eileen, I'm fascinated and I, I need to keep pouring over this. And now, I realize that I got a lot more work to do because it's not just cranking up my deep sleep. It's there's a whole other component here that I hadn't given enough consideration to. So I got I got some work to do. All right. Well, thank you so much, Neil. I really had a lot of fun today. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely. Dr. Eileen Leary there. Don't worry. She was kind enough to share the full dissertation. So you'll find a link on our website and in the show notes, not only to that, but also to the poster that went with it. Now, with the whole hospital and falling down the stairs thing, it feels like forever since I've had a chance to talk to my friend, Dr. Michael Grandner from the University of Arizona. But let's see what's on his mind this week. All right, Michael, how goes your prep for the twin-demic? 
<laughs> yeah, I know. So we're, you know, like everyone else, we're, we are we are holding up. It's interesting watching what the uh, case numbers for COVID are doing in various places around the world. And, and you know, I, I, I this has absolutely nothing to do with sleep other than it's giving people something else to be stressed about. Um, just on a, on a whim this morning, I ran the numbers for what herd immunity would look like here in uh, my neck of the woods, which is the province of Ontario. So, you know, you figure that in Ontario where we have a 5.8% death rate from COVID-19, um, you know, so that's 5.8% of cases uh, and in fatality. Wow. Um, it would, it would, res- it would require that about 800 and some odd thousand people uh, potentially would die in order for us to get to the herd immunity stage. And so it's wow. interesting watching as people throw around the idea that, well, you know, we don't really need a vaccine. We could just get the herd immunity. Aren't we close to that already? And I look and I go, no, nope, that's not really how herd immunity works. But, you know, thanks for coming to the party. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting how now everybody thinks they're an epidemiologist because they think they understand these things. Right. You know? But and, these, are, and, these are complicated ideas that, that are nuanced and it's like the people who say 1% is a small number, you know, 1% of a dollar is not that much, but 1% of a million people is a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Yeah. And now I wonder, and without throwing any uh, particular world leaders under the bus, does, because you're not an epidemiologist, um, nope. but I wonder if this for lack of a better description, sort of assault on science makes it difficult for people who are in branches of medicine and science that have nothing to do with COVID-19. Does it make, for example, does it make your job trickier? Yeah. And and it has to do with that. uh, Our our society is going through some growing pains right now where um, information is becoming much more easily accessible and, um, which is, I think, at the end of the day, sort of a good thing. But then um, it used to be that, you know, the only per- people who like had access to the medical journals were the scientists and the doctors. And they said, well, here's what the medical journals say. Um, now we have everyone and their brother opining and being able to tell the difference and interpret interpret the results properly in context with the appropriate caveats um, requires like you could read the words and know what all the words on the page mean um, but not really understand what the message is without without certain aspects of training and this is this is what graduate school is for you know as, as so I've got a good friend he work he's a he's actually not in academia at all he's he's a, a computer specialist he does um, IT network support for a big company and, and he said look Half of my job is Googling the answer to the questions people have. He's like, but the difference between me and you is I know what to Google. I know how to figure out what results are the proper results. And I know how to read them and scan them quickly to get the information that I need. And I know how to understand it properly in context. Um, It's not that the information isn't there for everybody. It's just actually kind of the training is knowing how to make sense of it. Sure. And I see that a lot with scientific and medical knowledge where people get these numbers thrown around, they Google them and they look them up and, and they see this and they think they understand what they mean because it's presented in a way that kind of makes sense. But they don't understand and they don't know what they don't know. And then and then we have this we have this idea that that, you know, you know, opinions, you know, my interpretation and your interpretation are equally valid because we read the same sources. And that's not really true all the time. Like I, I, I could read, uh, you know, I can read an information technology architecture article and form an opinion around it. But I don't know what I don't know. I don't know the context that I'm missing. And sure. I have to be a little humble. And I think, I don't know, I just think in a society we've gotten to the point where information is accessible um, and people think they understand it, but they kind of don't. Um, and so I find myself battling this all the time. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite examples is... Um, and to be totally honest, I don't, I don't really remember what the context was, but there was a big thing, um, in the press about science and science funding, um, that had nothing to do with, with anything with COVID or anything, but it was about, um, 
that the National Institute of Health, NIH, which is a national treasure, which is probably is the largest funder of biomedical research in the world, um, and might be as much as the entire rest of the world all put together, to be honest. Um, and every biomedical researcher, their career lives and dies by NIH because they're the only ones who can afford to fund science in, in biomedical in the biomedical world. Um, but then someone, you know, wanted to pick apart the federal budget who didn't really understand things, and they looked at the NIH budget and they said, wait. NIH spends how many tens of millions of dollars a year on fruit fly genetics research? <laughs> why the heck? Who cares about fruit flies? I hate fruit flies. Right. Like, why do we? Why do we? Why are we spending all this money studying their genetics? Let's just kill them all. You know, like, what? Why, why, why do we? Why do we care? And it was this whole big thing on the news and a waste of government money and blah 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 blah. But what people don't understand is, well, yeah, I mean, I hate fruit flies too, but. That's not the point. It's we're not we don't study fruit flies because like some scientist with big glasses like thinks fruit flies are the coolest creatures ever, <laughs> and somebody funded that. First of all, if you know how hard it was to get funding from NIH, I mean, like you would not be complaining. But what people don't understand is this: what we really want to learn about is human genetics, and the reason we want to learn about human genetics is because actually what we're learning is. The, the key to a lot of diseases is not genetics, which is what we thought it was in the 90s. It's really probably epigenetics, which is you and I have the same gene, but we live in different places with different sunlight patterns and different food and different social interactions and different environment. And our genes respond to the environment, our same genes respond to the environment in different ways, which leads to me encoding a certain protein out of DNA, maybe 2% more than you, but that creates a risk for something, for example. That's sure. epigenetics. It's the genetics of the uh, in context, which is so hard to study. But anyway, so that's what we want to understand is how how to target cures to individual people based on their genetic and epigenetic profile. But to understand that, that the, the gene map isn't it's 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 not like we have a detailed map uh, of what every gene is in an encyclopedia. and We just look it up. It's we're trying to figure all this stuff out. And. We can't exactly do a thing where we can't like assign people to like, okay, I'm going to cut open your brain at age five and you at age 10 and you at age 20 and, and then see what happens. Like we can't do that stuff. So we need animal research to be able to, to do this. And what people don't realize is almost all of the advances in human genetics, almost all of them, um, start with fruit fly genetics. Uh, and specifically fruit flies. This is why fruit flies are called out, because the fruit fly in particular, they have a couple of unique advantages. I, I don't do fruit fly research, uh, but I know this, um, that they're much simpler, obviously. They live, they, they breed and live and die much faster. So you can look at a life cycle across, you could look at aging um, within a period of like months rather than decades. So the studies get done faster. And their mechanical, their, their biological machinery, molecular machinery, is shockingly similar to ours. It's just more basic. So here's an example from my world of circadian rhythms. Like, you know, you've probably all heard now about how circadian rhythms won the Nobel Prize and, and, and because it's tied to like every disease system and heart function and all this stuff. But the, but the molecular machinery of the circadian rhythm inside the cell was originally discovered in fruit flies, where you have, I mean, a simplified version is you have fruit flies, they have two genes that control this process where one gene regulates the other one and they go in rhythm with each other. And they found it in the fruit fly because they could breed a million of them and find the mutations and, and, and target where it is. That tells you, all right, this is, it's probably not exactly this simple in humans, but now we take a step up to a small mammal like a mouse, which is why the next uh, most common um, animal you see in genetic work is mice because they're he they're mammals, so they share a lot of um, the genetic code that humans do because a lot of the similar patterns. But they're much more complicated than an invertebrate um, like like a fruit fly. So then what they do is they know where to look in the mouse for the genes. Lo and behold, in that in in those spots, instead of two genes, there's actually there's two there's one of the same one, but the other one there's. There's like five different versions of it. And then there's this whole other system in terms of how they're connected, which is another layer of complication. But the point is, we knew where to look and we found it and we worked it out. And that's actually what won the Nobel Prize. Then now that we know where it is in the mouse, because you can, you know, they live and they die and you can slice open their brains because humans tend not to volunteer for that. Um, <laughs> so mind so you, neither do the mice. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> to be fair, that's true. Um 
And so then now we do where to look at humans. And so then what you can do is you can, you can take human DNA and take a look at the, at the, those genes in sort of that spot. And it turns out ours are very similar to the mouse. It's just slightly different where they're nocturnal and we're not, and they have slightly, di- but we knew exactly where to look. And the point of this whole being is that, of course, we have to spend a whole ton of money studying genetics and fruit flies, but it's not because of the fruit flies. It's because that's where we under, that's how we understand where to look in the other mammals. And then in, that's why we do all this work on mice, because we know mice aren't humans. Mouse researchers know this. It's just there's certain things you can do with mice you just can't do with humans. Um, and you could do it much faster, knowing that it's not going to be perfectly accurate, but at least it, it, it tells you where to look. It tells you what's probably happening in a way that you can't do in a human, but you can then test behaviorally in a human, for example. And so this is why why science is so complicated, because... If you didn't know that, and if you didn't hadn't had years of training with people who do animal research and, and, and understand the context of their work and what it means, you'd think, ugh, another one of those news articles that cured cancer in mice that we're never going to see in humans, or, or, or like, why are we funding what? I don't, I don't care about rats and mice. I hate rats and mice. Why are we studying them? It's like, well, there's reasons for this. And sure. of course, I've oversimplified. But what you're talking about is a real problem where now that we have all have access to the information, we don't all know what to do with it. And, and we, we, have, we have a simultaneous increase in access to scientific information, but we have not had a parallel increase in scientific education. Um, and that, I think, is, is, is where people think that they understand something because it makes sense to them, but they don't, they don't understand that there's, th- there's pieces of the equation that they're totally missing that they don't even know that they're missing. Sure. And so the same people that would opine, you know, we should just kill all the mice and rats and kill all the fruit flies are the ones that are online um, uh, being amateur epidemiologists. Right. And they're like, you know, it's the same sort of people that say, well, a 1% fatality rate isn't that big of a deal. You have a disease that that affects, you know, let's say it'll affect 5% of the population and 1% of them will die. Those are all very small numbers. Like I think of 100 people in my life you know, if, if one tenth of one of those people die, like, is that's not really very much, but you, but there's, there's a thing called, um, the law of large numbers, which is an epidemiology thing for small numbers get very big when you talk about big numbers. So like a one, a, a point one, if you, if you increase life expectancy by, you know, 1% in one segment of the population, that would be huge. If you so there's a there was a great um op-ed in the New York Times a bunch of years ago. I think it was New York Times. Um actually it was written by Newt Gingrich. Um and I'll never forget this, where he was he was um involved in politics when the, the US doubled the NIH research budget back in, in under the Clinton administration. And he was talking about how this was a few years, it was maybe five years ago, uh that he wrote this, but I I'm I'm very glad that he did because he made the case that actually it's time to double it again. And, and he made the case that, look, because of the law of large numbers, if we take Alzheimer's disease and if we identify, if we can, if we can diagnose Alzheimer's disease for just four years sooner in everyone who has it and do nothing else, that will save more money than the entire NIH budget all combined. Forget everything we're doing with cancer and heart disease and obesity and everything else. Then that's just one piece of the, of it. The other thing he says, forget all that. Just patents alone, that the that the that the money funded um, every dollar. I think that the number that he quoted was every dollar in patents um, in, in NIH funding generates a dollar ten in in licensing revenue and economic um, movement on um, on inventions and patents alone. Forgetting all the cures and everything else. So it's it's just these large numbers. People people have a hard time wrapping around the difference between a million and a billion. You know. Here's what I love about talking to my friend Michael Grandner is that <laughs> before I hit the record button, we floated out about three or four things to each other that we thought, oh, maybe we could have some fun talking about that or maybe we could have some fun talking about this. Um, and, and then instead, I hit the record button. I threw him a curveball that was completely out of left field uh, that was something we hadn't even discussed talking about prior to me hitting the record button. And we just spent 15 minutes talking about it because <laughs> I can say on your mark, get set, 
talk science to Michael Grandner and he's riveting for 15 minutes on a topic that he didn't even know was coming. Listen, <laughs> I, um, I, I, I love having you on as often as we can. Um, and, and I'm psyched that you and uh, Seema are doing alternating weeks together because it's fun to get the two different perspectives on what's going on in the sleep world. I know we didn't really cover sleep, although we did kind of cover some stuff that's keeping people awake at night for sure as we try to navigate all of this. And, and it's, you know, what you You've been saying about people's access to scientific information, but not scientific education, I think plays into the sleep world a little bit when you jump into places like Facebook and Reddit and things like that. And as you know, the entire genesis of this project for me, looking at the absolute garbage information that's being put out there on the Internet by people who don't really know what they're talking about. And so trying to combat some of that, because I imagine for a clinician, it can often be troublesome um, yeah. when people come walking in to see their doctor and and their actual doctor, their actual sleep expert doctor is like the ninth person that they've seen <laughs> about their sleep problem because Dr. Google was way up on their list of people they should talk to first. Yeah, you know, I mean, and and you know, the the good thing is though, it's I think it's starting to change. I think we're 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 a generation behind things like smoking and alcohol and and, and other things, but we're getting there. And I think uh, I think as long as people find us eventually, I think they usually end up happy. Um, and that's why that's why I'm glad we're talking about this. Yeah, Michael, thanks so much for the time again this week. Thanks a lot. And finally, on the snooze button this week, a catch up with my friend, Dr. Seema Kosla from the North Dakota Center for Sleep. Okay, I am excited to talk to you this week because I ever since I saw a study that popped up yesterday from the uh, University of Helsinki talking about dreams and COVID, I was like, oh, I can't wait to bounce this off of Seema. So according to this study, uh, and they studied thousands and thousands of people, this is not a small study. Um, They had people make notes about their dreams and the majority of people who were in some form or another dreaming about COVID and that's what their nightmares were about. And it was everything from uh, physical distancing problems to uh, PPE to apocalyptic dreams and dystopian dreams, all this different stuff. Are people showing up at your office saying I'm having nightmares about COVID? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I was, it's so funny that you say that. I was just reading something on the Yale website. Uh, Christine Wan is a sleep person, a sleep specialist at Yale. And she was talking about this. And she was talking about how we do see this uptick um, and that it probably is not as maybe scary as we think it is. It's not really unhealthy. It may just be a way for us to work out what we're stressed about. Uh, and they also talked about how they saw this after 9 11. Oh, I didn't know the 9-11 part. Isn't that interesting? So, I mean, other than perhaps being a reset, because we've had a lot of conversations on this show lately about the importance of REM sleep. Um, if you've got bad dreams, nightmares that are ne- maybe bad enough to the point where they wake you up, you know, one of those sit bolt upright in bed in the middle of the night uh, after a nightmare thing, it, are those necessarily bad for your sleep or is that a sign that everything's okay because obviously your REM sleep game is, you know, working well? How does that, how do I interpret that? Well, so yes and no, right? I mean, there definitely is nightmare disorder and some people become really afraid of going to sleep. And you can even do image like nightmare rewriting therapy to really get into the nitty gritty of why this is happening, right? Because if if you always have nightmares, you're probably going to avoid going to sleep and then become sleep deprived, which is probably just going to make the nightmares worse. So if it be so, so if dreams cause their own special brand of insomnia, because you're sort of apprehensive about the idea of even being asleep to begin with, because who's no, who knows what stories are going to unfold, then that's when it becomes a problem. Right. And then of course, you know, we, we always need to be mindful of, is this nightmare or is somebody maybe acting out their dreams? Right. Like, do they maybe have REM sleep behavior disorder and they start, you know, trying to leap out of a window or trying to harm their bed partner? Okay, so if I show up in your office and I'm complaining about having uh, COVID dreams, um, I mean, not that I'm asking for medical medical advice, and we certainly don't dish out medical advice on the show. But if I show up in your office, what's where do I go? What do I do? How do I fix this? 
You know, so a lot of it is trying to really reconcile why we're having this, right? I mean, is it purely situational? Is it all related to COVID? And is it a matter of, of looking at what you're doing? You know, are you in a high risk situation? You know, my, my oldest daughter works at a public facing place and her coworker just found out that she tested positive for COVID last night. Wow. And yeah. So of course she's been on edge, understandably, you know, and then of course there's that anger of, well, you know, (laughs) why aren't you doing anything about it? Why are you coming to work? Right. Right. But then really kind of reconciling that, is that what's driving it? Is it something that you feel helpless about? Is it something that you can rein it in and, and have control over? You know, can you make sure that everybody wears a mask, for example? Can you make sure everybody stays away? Or is it just that you're feeling so helpless and overwhelmed that maybe you need therapy? You know, maybe you need to talk to somebody about it. Is this just a plain old therapy or is this CBTI, you think? Maybe. Maybe a little of each plus a little bit of image uh, rewriting. Interesting. Okay, you know, and so- really kind of getting into it, right? Because you can't just lump everybody into a box that like, oh, we have a nightmare. Boom. This is your solution. Sure. Right. We really have to delve into each individual person and kind of pull out what we think this means and, and how significant is it? You know, is this once in a blue moon? Is it after you've had alcohol? You know, is it maybe is your oxygen level dropping? Like my mom, before she was diagnosed with sleep apnea, and of course she never told me, right? Um, had these horrible nightmares and never said anything about it. And when she had her sleep study, her oxygen level was crazy low and she got put on CPAP. And that's one thing that she said. She's like, you know what? I don't have those nightmares anymore. So, I mean, given everything that's going on in the world, is this a good time to be trying to book a sleep test? So this is this new, so when March hit, right, we as medical people had to decide who needed to come in and who needed to stay home. So if you had like a heart attack or a hot appendix, of course, you need to come into the hospital, right? But if you're just having routine care, well, you can probably stay home. But then there's emerged this new category of stuff that's important, but maybe not immediately necessary. And I think that that's where sleep testing lives. And so it still is important and we really want to make sure that we're being safe about what we do. And so, yeah, sleep's important. You know, sleep is important for immunity. They did that study years ago where they had these volunteers. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how they got people to volunteer for the study, but they they had them track their sleep and then they introduced rhinovirus, yeah. the virus that causes the common cold, right? And then they watched them and they saw that the people who got less sleep were more likely to get sick. Yeah, we uh, we talked about that uh, particular study extensively. If you go back, and I'll put links on the website and in the show notes to this. If you go back, there is uh, an episode of the Snooze Button called um, Sleep, the Common Cold, and Other Viruses, where we talked to Dr. Eric Prather about that study. There's also two other uh, episodes of the show where we've covered sleep and your immune system, one of them with uh, Jenny Potterbaum and the other with um, with Dr. Céline Bastien. Uh, the president of the Canadian Sleep Society. So those are on the website as well, how all these things can play nice together to maybe give us a better chance of fighting off this virus. Because you figure if your exercise game is uh, in tune, then your sleep game will be better. If your sleep is fine, then you'll be exercising better. And so those things feed well off of each other. And both of those things feed your immune system, which is uh, particularly helpful at a point like this. Now, if I figure that maybe I need to get some answers about maybe my, there's some aspect of my sleep that's leading to these COVID somnia nightmares, can I get maybe some of my answers from my trusty dream to headband tracker? (laughs) I was wondering how you were going to segue into that. (laughs) (laughs) So can I, is, will that be able to maybe, if I can't get in for a sleep lab, can I pick up bits and pieces of data from that that might help me? Like, for example, with your mom's situation and her oxygen level, can I pick up these kind of things from any of my wearables? Possibly. Okay. Possibly. I mean, a lot of wearables have opened up, as you know, the oximetry uh, and the ones that we've seen maybe don't give you the granularity that you would like, but they definitely highlight that your oxygen level is low. Uh, and sometimes, as you know, in uh, with sleep apnea, a lot of the time the sleep apnea is worse during REM sleep. And so we'll see a dip, you know, intermittently through the night that probably fits with REM. 
you know, I think it's important to really be mindful of looking for sleep apnea. You know, last week they released a study showing that sleep apnea is one of those comorbid conditions that carries with it a higher risk of bad outcomes with COVID. And so we really want to be mindful of, you know, looking for it, assessing it, treating it. Uh, we think it's, it's probably protective to treat your sleep apnea in this new world of COVID. At some point, we'll get into a really granular conversation, you and I, about um, my first couple of weeks with this headband that you sent me. I know um, I'm interested. What do you think? Well, okay. So with the exception of the one night that I woke up, and I think you saw me say something on the, about this on Twitter, uh, I woke up in the middle of the night and discovered that the headband was clear across the other side of the room. I don't know how it got there. I don't remember <laughs> taking it off. I certainly don't remember pitching it there, but something happened, I guess, in the middle of the night where it wound up 15 feet away on the other side of the room. So I, uh, other than that, impressive. I haven't even noticed that I've got it on. And according to what it tells me, because it also tracks, you know, which a wrist wearable doesn't, um, it tracks what sleep position I was in. So according to what I've learned from this thing, I love falling asleep on my right side. Um, and I don't really spend a lot of time on my back, which is great news because I had, you know, mild sleep apnea. So says my friend Mark Bullis at Sunnybrook. Um, so the on my back thing is great. I apparently spend hardly any time there at all. And the cool thing is I, because I'm sleeping on my sides and even occasionally I'll flip over and sleep on my stomach. Sorry, my chiropractor, but every once in a while, <laughs> it's a thing I got to do. Um, I don't even notice that it's there. And apparently the me sleeping on my sides or me sleeping on my stomach, it doesn't disrupt the headband. It doesn't move it into an uncomfortable position. I was way more uncomfortable one night when I realized I'd left my glasses on um, than, than I've ever been with this headband. So that part was really cool. It was the one thing I thought was going to be a significant hurdle was this discomfort of having something on my head. So you've probably got the perfect shaped head for it. <laughs> yeah, I'm a phrenologist's dream. If <laughs> lumpy is a perfect shape for a dream too, then I'm your guy. <laughs> so that's amazing. You could sleep on your stomach with it. That's impressive. Yeah, I don't know if that's necessarily something that they recommend, um, but it's just there are times when I know the only place I can feel like I'm I'm comfortable if I'm having trouble falling asleep is if I turn over and yeah, no trouble at all. It doesn't disrupt the readings. It doesn't do anything uh, or set anything askew. I'm I'm excited about at least being able to check off the I can wear it and it's comfortable box. That's a cool thing. I like it. So are you getting more sleep than you thought you were? Um, sometimes, but for me, getting more sleep than I thought I was means more like, uh, five hours, five hours, 15 minutes, um, than, you know, previously when I thought I was getting, uh, four, you know, which is kind of those results that I was getting from my Fitbit. And by the way, that tends to be what my, my Fitbit still spits out is that oh. that's, that's what I, yeah, there is so a, there's discrepancy, a disconnect. big oh. discrepancy between the two sets of numbers, particularly in the sleep staging. But we knew that already because Fitbits right. don't do sleep staging. Um, I mean, they, they say they do, but they don't. Um, but I, I was surprised to see the discrepancy in the numbers. And obviously based on the conversations that you and I have had, I'm going to lean toward the dream being more accurate. And so if it says I got five and a half hours and my Fitbit says I got four, well, the dream is right. That's you know, a really big discrepancy. I'm surprised by that. Yeah, that's happened a couple of times. I mean, I mean, typically they're in the same neighborhood. And as with all of these things, and you've warned me this, and Michael Grander's warned me about this, the trend is your friend. You know, it's right. it's more useful. And Guy Leshsoner, I remember saying uh, similar things as well. One of the places where, for example, a Fitbit will shine is being able to highlight for you if something has changed in your sleep and some, and, and you're having results that are unusual for you. Uh, so that's where that comes in handy. And I still, I mean, I still wear my Fitbit to bed every night. Um, but I, I'm, I'm certainly recognizing which thing I can lean on which device for in terms of accuracy. So it's, it's a fun ride and I'm excited to see what this does going forward as I start getting a little bit more persnickety about the sleep hygiene and, and, you know, making sure, for example, that I'm taking my Mirapex at the same time every night and all those sorts of things. Because right now, this first couple of weeks has just been an experiment. Can I sleep with this thing on 
and not have it keep me awake? And so far, the answer to that's been, yeah, you're fine. It's not going to keep you awake at all. So to me, that's a huge win. I'm actually really encouraged that you're finally over the five hour mark. That's fantastic. Um, well, and, and, you know, Mark was saying that, um, at, at Sunnybrook, Mark Boulos was saying that, you know, maybe I have been getting that all along. Right. It's that maybe my periodic limb movement disorder was being picked up by my Fitbit as you're awake. Oh, I totally agree. I think that's the, I think that's the danger of it is that we're not really seeing it and we're underestimating how much sleep we're getting. Yeah. So, uh, so like I say, the, the feeling like I have something that is, is more, accurate in terms of its its own built-in cred um i'm i'm a big fan of the stream and i'm 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 excited to continue using it going forward as i start experimenting with all these various tweaks uh, to see exactly how that all shakes out and how it plays out. But listen, I know you got stuff to do. Um, um, and, and we're all going to stay riveted to, um, the president's own COVID nightmares over the weekend. We're going to see where that all plays out too. Cause, uh, as you and I sit down for this conversation, we're about 12 hours removed from him tweeting that he and the first lady had, uh, had tested positive. So I wonder if that's going to kick off its own version of COVID somnia for people who are, you know, maybe the huge Trump supporters out there are going to start having their own versions of nightmares. And that'll be interesting to watch as well. Or maybe the people in New Jersey that he was sort of, you know, rubbing elbows with before. Exactly. Yep. Uh, and and so the repercussions on this are real. I mean, if you're sitting there and you think we're kidding around, um, listen, if you are a big supporter of, of the president and you've been listening to his guidance on COVID-19 for these many months and now he's been diagnosed uh, and he's tested positive, then maybe all of a sudden that gives you pause and maybe it's going to impact your sleep as well because this thing, this stuff like this matters. And especially when we look at this study that's out of the University of Helsinki, it's happening for more people than it's not. So it'll be interesting to monitor. It will be. All right. That does it for this week. We are back next week, unless, you know, there's another flight of stairs in my future. Um, In the meantime, remember that you can get this episode and the other 47 that go along with it on our website, along with links and information and a whole ton of different things you can do to support the show, both tangibly and otherwise. So that's all waiting for you at the snoozebutton.com. Till we get together again, my name's Neil Headley. Hey, get some sleep, would you?